so let's uh, let's get going. Well, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's a, it's a great pleasure to welcome in Eisner today John Helmond, who is the vice director of a sister institute, ELSI. ELSI is uh, the Earth Life uh, Science Institute uh, at the Tokyo Institute of uh, Technology. And uh, we have with us here John, who is uh, the vice director of uh, this institute and uh, one of uh, the one of the foundational members of that uh, institute, which started in 2012, three, two years after our institute here at Kyushu University. John uh, was born in South Dakota in the United States, and then he earned his bachelor's degree in geology and geophysics from uh, the Arizona State University. Then he continued on at the University of California in Los Angeles, where he did his master's and PhD degree in geophysics and space physics. After that, uh, being uh, curious and uh, going around the world, he ended up in France. He continued his work at the Institut de Physique du Globe de Paris, IPGP. After he spent time over there in France, he came to the British Columbia in Canada, and then uh, he moved to the University of California at the Berkeley also. And then when this golden opportunity arose, uh, he wrote, he helped, he was a key participant in writing the proposal for the LCWPI Center at uh, the Tokyo Institute of Technology, where he serves uh, as uh, as a vice director and he's instrumental, especially on the international aspects of that center through his uh, hard work on hiring uh, new members, new faculty, new principal investigators. John is very well known on, uh, in, 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 in the field of deep earth science where his contributions helped uh, to further our understanding. He received a number of awards and amongst those awards uh, I, I would like to mention the Memorial Prize from the International Union of Geodesy and Geophysics in 2008, and the Jason Morgan Early Career Award from the American Geophysical Union in 2010. Today he's gonna pick, he is gonna talk about the memories of the planet. This is a presentation that is different from the presentations we are usually are used to, 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 to hear in our center about the energy, about catalysis, about materials, about transport. But believe me, all these words that I mention about catalysis, about materials, about transport, they are, they are key significations, if I would say, that are used at the LC Center as they study the Earth, the evolution of chemistry on the Earth, the evolution of life, and so on and so forth. Please keep your eyes open. Who knows, we may bring, uh, we may create a new interdisciplinary domain between Eisner and Elsie. This is the ultimate goal, if you wish, of this uh, presentation, to instigate this fusion of, of thinking about these common themes that uh, both uh, institutes are researching upon. With no further ado, John, the floor is yours. Please. Okay. Can, can, can everybody hear me? Is it be a little bit too loud? If it's if it's maybe this is better. I'll just put it down here. Is that okay? Okay. Thank you for inviting me. Here, I, uh, I'm really, it's really a thrill to visit other WPI institutes. I am a uh, big fan of this program, a big fan of the project, the aims, the goals of the WPI. I really think that it's uh, important for Japan, and I believe it can do wonders, it has been doing wonders, in fact, for the national universities in Japan. And I, I'm really thrilled to be a part of the project, and uh, 
I love the opportunity to, to, to be in Japan and to, to be a part of history. Um, I met Petros uh, only recently at the WPI Program Committee meeting in uh, Tokyo, uh, where every year we have to go and uh, justify our existence and the amount of money they give us. And, uh, and it was a really nice me meeting. I invited him to Elsie just for a, a quick afternoon visit, but uh, he, he invited me to come here. I was already coming to Kyushu University to teach a three-day short course in, the, in the geophysics. And so um, I'm really happy that I can make this happen and, and very pleased to be here. I really would like to uh, reiterate what Petro said. I believe that we really would like to uh, be open-minded and create new multidisciplinary domains. We want to make connections. Uh, I think for a long time, the trend of science was more or less uh, reductionist. We we're trying to divide things down and really focus. But now that Humpty Dumpty is, uh, you know, as, as the old poem goes, has fallen apart, we have to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And I think that's a really fun project. So today I'm going to talk about uh, the Earth in a different way than maybe you have thought about it in the past. Um, it is more of a geological perspective. It is something we are accustomed to thinking about. Um, a really key concept in Earth science and planetary science is deep time. We say deep time meaning uh, just like deep space or deep anything. Uh, how far can you fathom it? Um, the Earth is four and a half billion years old, right? So a year in that time frame is like the blink of an eye in a lifetime. It's nothing, right? It's, it's, we, we are just the most recent thing to happen. We are just the tiniest little epsilon fluctuation, which has just recently risen on this planet. And, uh, but we are transforming it at a very rapid rate. And, things, and life is transforming its host planet at a fast rate. And it's good to put all of this in the context of what's happened before and how the planet works. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the broad science topics and about deep time and deep space. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about some challenges of uh, making a, a successful WPI Institute. Um, I hope both of these are, are, are useful. So I just actually just said this. Um, so you guys already know about WPI. I don't need to really uh, talk about this so much. But WPI is underscored by four concepts. Advancing leading edge research, establishing international research environments, reforming research organizations, and creating interdisciplinary domains. And uh, we take each four of these things very, very, very seriously. If we fail at any single one, then we believe we have failed as an institute. We failed as a WPI program. So we, we do not ignore any of these, and these are all, these are all uh, a big part of our organization. And I'll see, uh, leading edge research, what does that mean? We decided that we were going to try and tackle uh, one of the most challenging scientific questions of all time, and that is the origin of life. Um, and it's something that we believe we can make a lot of progress on. We believe it's a hot topic right now. We believe that a lot of pieces are coming together for us to make some new leap in understanding. It doesn't mean that we promise to solve the question once and for all, in the, in, it, it might not even be possible to solve it in the way you typically think of a problem being solved. Um, but at least to make some major progress along this line is, is one of our, our main goals. Um, establishing international research environments. Um, in fact, to address origin of life is an international effort. We cannot do it alone, no single country, no single institution can do this. We've been uh, developing a global network of researchers and trying to reestablish this field of research um, and get people to talk to each other instead of past each other, things like this. So having the diversity and the resources of the world is much better than having those of just a single country. We have to change the way that research organizations function in order to accomplish this because um, the way that traditional research is funded or supported or organized 
is just not suited to these kinds of projects. It just doesn't work. And so inevitably, we have to uh, make changes in order to facilitate this kind of project. And the origin question, I think, is uh, a really nice rallying point to bring together a lot of diverse disciplines. So far, we've had a lot of uh, interaction with the Institute for Physics and Mathematics of the Universe at Tokyo University. They're, part of their research uh, program is to understand the origin of the universe. Um, we're interested in the origin of stars and planets and life. And then maybe in the future, a new WPI institute will uh, try to understand the origin of humans and consciousness and the ability to ask the question, what is the origin of this or that thing? So anyways, we see this, these are all interlinked and all re interrelated. Of course, you guys have a non-Japanese director, which is very special. And I think it's a very challenging uh, job to, to do. And I really respect the, the, the kind of effort and, and that it takes to do this. Um, how did I end up being a vice director? I'm relatively young to be a, a, an administrative role at one of these institutions. Um, it just, uh, it's just the way things turned out. I ended up having to, uh, to take on a lot more administrative duties than I thought I would otherwise have. And I ended up reorganizing the institute. I ended up taking over the recruitment and managing these things. And uh, once you're doing the job of a vice director, that's how you become a vice director. So if you don't want to do that job, then don't do those things. Um, <clears throat> so our scientific roadmap is, is as follows. And I know this is a little bit small. And actually, if we would have maybe thought about a ways to, uh, it might be a trick for this. Or I can just point. Um, it's better to have a, a landscaped uh, image than a, than a, a portrait type. But, um, here's, the, here's the two phases of Elsie's history. So we have phase one down here, and this is where we're at right now. The idea is that we come in along these different rays, these different disciplinary trajectories. And if we were a traditional department, academic department or, or institution, is there a button that, there we go. In a traditional place, we would enter along one ray path and we would exit along the same ray path. And there'd be no uh, commingling between these. What we try to do is we try to make the institute into a lens which can refract these different disciplinary trajectories together to focus on common questions that can be interesting to all the different fields. And we identified these questions, and we've had working groups working on these different areas. Um, it might be hard to read in the back. Actually, it probably is very hard to read. But these are things like Earth's building blocks. What is the Earth made of? Um, the early crust, mantle, and core. Um, the early ocean and atmosphere. How did the Earth acquire an ocean and atmosphere? Uh, Co-evolution of the Earth life system. What's life was uh, formed, how do they communicate, what is the sym symbiotic relationship between the planet and life, uh, proto-metabolism, geological supply of prebiotic compounds, so how, where, does, where does the initial uh, reservoir of amino acids and other things which become more complex molecules, peptides and such, how does that happen, where do they come from in the, in the geological environment, and metabolism, metabolism is a really key thing for life. In our second stage, after the midterm review, uh, we see our goal as forming these uh, multidisciplinary domains, which is what they're called in the WPI program, where we take planetary science and life science and we really link them together and we try to form new disciplines out of this and we put our resources behind these, these things. This, of course, is still to be done. This is just a vision right now. It hasn't actually happened. <clears throat> so at LC, we have uh, a very lively atmosphere. It's very international. Um, we mix uh, Japanese scientists, and we have, here's a French scientist here, here's an American here, and Japanese. Um, we have a lot of fun events. Every Friday, we have an event we call LC Izakaya where we get together and we, we drink beer together, and it's a great place for new people to come and mix. Um, 
so we try to create this this environment that catalyzes this. So let's let's start the the kind of discussion of the scientific problem. Um, so where do planets come from? Well, they come they come around about when the, the stars are forming at about the same time. In fact, the planets are made of the junk that's left over after the stars form. So we're talking about 0.1% of the solar system mass, which is left over in a disk. And this is a textbook uh, story line of planetary formation. So you start with something like a nebular dust and gas cloud. This could result, for example, from the explosion of a supernova. And uh, as it starts to gravitationally collapse, it, it spins up owing to conservation of angular momentum. And then you form this disk. It's a very hot disk of dust and gas, which uh, if you perturb it, you get lumps which start to form, these mass lumps. And those become gravitational attractors, and they start to clean up debris. You get gaps, ring gaps, we call these. This was predicted, actually, by the philosopher Immanuel Kant uh, in, the, I believe, the 16th century, just by by thinking about it. But we can actually see these in other uh, exoplanetary systems today. And then eventually, all this debris accumulates in the planets, and we just have these little point, they look from afar like point masses orbiting the central star. So we can actually see this stuff happening in the universe. We just point the telescopes into the sky. We've had these wonderful uh, missions. Um, we can see supernova explosions beautiful stuff. We can see nebula, nebular clusters, little star clusters forming here. This is where uh, new stars and new planetary systems are being formed. And we can see these uh, clusters evolving into protoplanetary disks. Here is a very, very young uh, stellar system. And you have a central star, and it looks like it's starting to clear out some stuff from the vicinity and then there's this other debris still orbiting. So this is in the very early stage of uh, stellar system formation. Uh, once we get to planet formation itself, we have a transition from observations to cartoons. This is a place where we uh, don't know a lot and it's actually one of our major focuses at LC uh, to understand what goes on at the planetary scale. Um, as these small bits of debris accumulate and they start to become gravitationally attracted to protoplanets, the collisions get bigger and bigger and bigger, and then eventually you have uh, these large collisions between these, these bits, these giant impactors. Actually, one of our uh, researchers at ELSI recently discovered uh, giant impacts occurring in exoplanetary systems, really young exoplanetary systems. So it seems to be a process which is probably typical in the early uh, stellar system formation. And we end up with the early Earth environment, which is probably characterized by a lot of stuff still falling from the sky, a uh, very hot surface. And then this eventually leads to that, right? Four and a half billion years later, it's a lot different. Um, so what we want to understand then is how processes that are happening at this time affect the Earth's history and evolution to the present time and link all of these time and spatial scales together. How do we even study the early solar system? This is a very good question because on the Earth there aren't very many places where you can find a rock which is close to the age of the planet. The oldest rocks that we can find are about 3.9 billion years old. Um, as I was discussing uh, in Iceland, or I mean in Greenland, the glaciers are melting back and they're exposing older and older rock terrain. So we've gone from uh, 3.8 billion year old rocks to 3.9 billion year old rocks. So if Icelander fails to succeed in, uh, in slowing the growth in uh, carbon in the atmosphere, then we'll see older and older rocks in, uh, in Greenland. But um, this is a uh, a, a cross section of a Hadean zircon. Okay, so this is a mineral grain which was formed, I think this one is about 4.2 billion years ago. This isn't a rock, but it's a single mineral crystal. What you see in here are zones. And zircon is a really, really nice crystal for preserving 
uh, isotopic signal signatures at the time when it was growing in a magma. And it inherits those and then preserves those. These Hadean zircons are really key for us to look at the process of an early Earth. We can also look at inclusions inside zircons um, as, as evidence for early Earth, uh, early solar system behavior. We also have zircons from the moon, for example. The moon itself, the surface is mostly old. There's, of course, a regolith, which is dust generated by impacts and cratering. But uh, beneath that, there's very old rocks, actually. The moon's surface is much older than the Earth's surface because the moon does not have plate tectonics. Plate tectonics continually resurfaces the Earth and renews it, whereas the moon does not. Uh, Mars is a similar story. Mars does not have plate tectonics. At least it hasn't for the last four or so billion years. Um, we can go to Mars and look at rocks. And we're actually looking at samples from the early solar system. We can also look at rocks which are still falling from the sky, you know, these meteorites. And this is a chondrite here, uh, something we think is representative of the material that formed uh, the planets in the first place. So there's a lot of different evidence that we can look at. So now to life. And I wrote in the abstract something that was supposed to catch your attention, which is that uh, you are a geological phenomenon. And the, it, in fact, it's true. We are geology ourselves. Um, as examples of this, I pointed out that our brains contain magnetite crystals, really tiny magnetite crystals. And these respond to uh, changes in the Earth's magnetic field. We actually have a compass built in. We don't necessarily use it, but other animals do use it. Birds, for example, are known to use these magnetite crystals in their brains to navigate uh, along their, their migration routes. Um, our teeth are made of fluorapatite. That's a nice hard mineral. It's very common in a lot of geological environments. Our bones are practically limestone, calcium carbonate, right? It's the same stuff you see precipitating from seawater in shallow marine environments. Our blood has a similar salinity as seawater. That's a very curious thing. Um, there's a lot of these similarities, but in fact, uh, every molecule in your body is replaced every few years, right? There's a mass, continuous mass flux between your body and the environment that surrounds you. And the molecules that are entering and leaving your body are exchanged throughout the entire Earth system. Some of those might have been subducted all the way down to the core of the Earth and then brought back up in a plume and exhaled in a volcanic eruption in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So this is a really, you know, we are an open system, and that means that we are a geological system. So this is my colleague, Joe Kirschvink. He's, uh, he's one of our PIs at LC. He's wearing this uh, thing which measures brain waves. And brain waves, you can measure these, they, they sync up to different stimuli and you can tell if the brain is recognizing stimuli because it changes the pattern of the brain waves. And uh, what he's doing is he's sitting inside of a chamber which can control the intensity of the magnetic field. And he changes it, and it's on the order of the Earth's magnetic field strength. So it's not super strong. But he's been able to show that by putting these things on people's heads, that actually our brains do actually recognize this. This is a real sixth sense that we have. We sense the magnetic field. The magnetic field itself is generated by convection in the Earth's core. OK, this is a dy dynamo action. Um, this is a, from a simulation that was done in the 1990s by Glatzmeyer and Roberts. It became very famous. Uh, one of the first successful numerical models of a dynamo in a freely convecting rapidly rotating fluid. Um, I won't get into too many details about this, but this is a remarkable process that occurs in the core of the planet, which is actually fueled by heat transfer, which is connected to plate tectonics and other processes at the surface. And then our brains are wired to this somehow. Um, as I mentioned, birds can navigate to the uh, magnetic field. These very ancient kinds of bacteria, they call magnetotactic bacteria, 
they grow these chains of magnetite crystals. And uh, this is thought to be one of the most primitive forms of eyesight. Because in most places, in a, in a marine environment, for example, the magnetic field is going to have some radial components, right? So by going up and down the magnetic field line, these bacteria are able to modulate whether they're in more oxidizing or reducing conditions or more sunlight or less sunlight, whatever it might be, which is going to enable them to optimize their metabolic processes and allow them to flourish. So this is uh, <clears throat> something very interesting. And some years ago, there was this uh, report by NASA, uh, some of you might have remember, where this, there's this meteorite which came from Mars. And when they looked at it, there was these little tiny chains of magnetite crystals in there. And people said, oh, well, that looks kind of like these guys. So maybe these are magnetofossils from Mars. Um, there turns out to be a lot of uh, problems with that interpretation upon closer examination. Actually, when I was entering my undergraduate, uh, I went to a talk by the scientists who proposed this. And uh, there was a lot of fighting and, and whatnot. But uh, it's, it's very interesting. One of our colleagues, actually the same guy, the same crazy guy who wears the, 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 the brainwave measure, measuring stuff, he believes that life on Earth actually started on Mars first. That uh, bacteria, which was on the surface, was uh, knocked away from Mars in an impact early in the solar system, carried to Earth and then uh, began to replicate and grow and flourish on Earth. He thinks that Mars' early environment was more suitable for origin of life than Earth's early environment. And so this is all, all debated. Um, magnetospheres in the, in the solar system. A lot of places have magnetic fields. Of course, the sun has a very uh, strong magnetic field. Uh, Mercury actually has a very weak magnetic field. It's been measured recently by the MESSENGER mission in great detail. Venus does not. Earth does. Jupiter has a very strong magnetic field. Saturn also has one. Uranus and Neptune have uh, magnetic fields. And Ganymede, actually, the a moon of Jupiter, has some sort of magnetic field which is being generated internally, which was discovered by the Galileo mission. Also, uh, in the early solar system, it looks like the moon had a magnetosphere. Samples returned from the Apollo mission she seemed to show evidence for remnant magnetism. So there was some sort of dynamo operating in the early moon. Um, Mars also seems to have evidence for some early magnetic field. It no longer has one, but uh, in, the, in the past it did. So now let's turn our attention back to the Earth. Um, Earth is a very dynamic place, but it happens very slow. Uh, this is a, this is a top, uh, topographic and bathymetric map of uh, the Japan Islands, right? This is, down here, is, this is the Marianas Trench. It's the deepest place on Earth, right? And it's only a little bit shallower through here. Uh, and then this is sea level. This is going from, you know, so many, many kilometers deep, like on the order of 10 kilometers deep to uh, zero kilometers right here. So in, in Tokyo, we're actually right next to one of the greatest uh, topographic anomalies on our planet. We just can't see it because it's covered in water. Um, if we could see it, perhaps it would scare, scare the hell out of us because it's, a, it's there because this is the Pacific tectonic plate and it's subducting underneath Japan. We also have here the Philippine plate, and this is subducting this way along this trench here. And then this is, of course, Kyushu over here, where we're, we're at right now. So this is a, a very dynamic place, a very dynamic process. I was mentioning that, uh, I was discussing with uh, Suji san earlier about carbon sequestration in sediments. It was probably, was it one of these areas you were looking at, the Philippine Sea Plate? And if you put carbon dioxide into the, the rocks there, it will go in, into the subduction zone and melt and then come back out again eventually, um, maybe over millions of years time scales. But the Earth is you know, four and a half billion years old and a million years is very slow. I was also mentioning that uh, 
most of the fossil fuels that we're using today were made in the Carboniferous era, which was hundreds of millions of years ago. That's enough time for the mantle to have overturned three or four times. So the subduction zones, this stuff goes into the earth and could have circulated deep into the interior and then back to the surface four or five times since all that carbon was deposited in the Carboniferous. So in terms of the Earth's natural carbon sequestration time scale, um, a million years is, 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 is nothing. It's very short. So um, here's a cross-section, a cartoon of that, that process. We have, <coughs> this is the crust here, which is about five kilometers thick. And then this is the lithosphere, about uh, 60 to 80 kilometers thick. And this subducts because it's cold and it goes down into the earth. Um, it melts, largely we think it melts here because the, there's low melting temperature components here, things that have a lot of carbon dioxide, a lot of H2O. Uh, you need that to induce melting here because this is in fact one of the coldest places in the mantle. Yet we're melting it. We know we're melting it because we're making uh, Mount Fuji's and Mount Asso's and, and things like that above it. So this is a, a really key part of the volatile and carbon cycle on the planet is the subduction zone cycle. So part of it at least melts and comes back up here and in, back into the atmosphere. Some of it may go back down into the deeper mantle if it can remain stable in, the, in, in particular mineral phases. Actually, I should mention that uh, there's another part of the carbon cycle which is associated with kimberlites. And kimberlites are how, where, that's where diamonds come from. These come from a hundred to uh, many hundreds. Some people have proposed up to a thousand kilometers deep in the in the earth. They rise up through the mantle, and the speed, the rate of rise, is like a shinkansen speed, right? So if it's coming from uh, 400 kilometers of the mantle, and it starts to erupt towards the surface, it'll be at the surface in a couple hours. And uh, somebody has actually proposed that under Japan is a place where there might be a lot of volatiles accumulating, a lot of carbon. If there was a kimberlite eruption right now, we wouldn't, it would take us probably a couple hours to even realize that it was some weird phenomenon propagating the surface. And those blow big holes in the ground and uh, in any case, there, there's a lot of things going on in the deeper Earth. The bigger picture is that plate tectonics is just the surface expression of this huge deep mantle conveyor belt, which goes down 3,000 kilometers deep. Uh, the subducting pieces of lithosphere are going down through the upper mantle, and then there, most of them are sinking eventually through the lower mantle. They're ponding above the core mantle boundary and absorbing heat there, these wiggly lines represent heat transfer. And then uh, there's a return flow which goes back up, which is hot. And some of this might go up in the form of plumes, which create hot spot tracks and volcanic islands like Hawaii and things like this. Um, we also think that there's continent scale features that are chemically distinct from the rest of the mantle that are sitting at the bottom of the mantle. We don't know exactly what they're made of or what they're doing, but they're there. And uh, that's one of, the, one of the features that we're interested in. In any case, the heat that's taken up by the subducting lithosphere pieces as it goes to the bottom of the mantle, uh, out of the core, is what drives convection in the core. And so the core is convecting and generating a magnetic field. And then this is causing, as the core cools, the inner core to crystallize out of the center. And so this is the, the big system, right? And us on the surface and our connection to the geology is just a, a scratching the surface here. You wouldn't see it. So it's smaller than a pixel. Um, but it's all connected, everything here. As I said, we are open systems. All of our molecules are, are being shared, even during our lifetimes, with the surrounding environments. So we are, we are a part of this. This is, this is a part of the, the living Earth. We can go even further than just looking at the planets itself. So here's uh, 
plot of time, and it's not to scale, uh, from the Big Bang to the present. So Big Bang being uh, like 13 billion years ago or so. And then the Earth radius on the vertical scale, going from the center of the Earth here to uh, the universe out here. And uh, everything that we care about on the Earth is in this box right here. So this is the formation of the Earth. And then this is the top, the top of the atmosphere right there. But of course, there's exchange between the atmosphere and the surface and the solar system. Uh, these are not closed boundaries. These are connected. There's overlaps here. In this system, which I've blown up to represent the biosphere, there's actually a lot going on. Uh, we believe that the processes that led to the development of life on Earth happened in the very early Earth, when there's plenty of energy available to drive these processes. So life started from using geochemical energy that was available in the natural environments until it learned to catalyze its metabolic processes. And once it could do that, then it could just coast. It's very, very easy life after life learned catalysis and uh, it formed cells which could regulate its environments and control its chemistry. Um, in any case, all of this stuff is, is connected and there's overlap in both space and time. And of course, our solar system comes from uh, you know, some sort of, prop we, we believe it's the third generation uh, solar system. So this was the third time that the material here has been processed in the supernova-like event since the beginning of the universe. And each time you go through uh, supernova in a nucleosynthesis cycle, you create heavier and heavier and heavier elements, right? So the Earth has a core, which is the size it is because there's enough iron that's been created by these three generations of nucleosynthetic events for it to have a core. So there's these numerous connections that span every, every, uh, every time scale imaginable across the, the, the universe. Of course, one of the ultimate questions we're interested in is how processes you know, on a planet can uh, lead to life more generally and life elsewhere in the universe. And that's, that's uh, of course, one of the biggest goals. And it could be one of the biggest discoveries of all time if uh, life were discovered somewhere else outside of the, our solar system. Um, I'm not going to go into detail on this, but if you, you can look up what is life, um, you'll find all these things. This is from Wik Wikipedia, if you just look it up. They say homeostasis. It's regulation of your internal environment to maintain a constant state. Um, organization, being structurally organized into cells and things like that. Metabolism, being able to use energy from your environment to sustain your, your systems and to replicate and grow and adapt in response to stimuli and reproduction. All of these things are kind of usual examples. In fact, we, we have a hard time, you know, we have all these things that we say are characteristics of life, but we could say this about a lot of things that aren't life. And that begins to, to <coughs> beg the question, what is life? And it's one of these things where this is when my son was six months old. He uh, began saying, ba, 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 ba. And I said, well, look, he's saying, dad, dad, dad. And my wife was like, no, he's not. I'm like, yeah, he is. And she's like, you'll, you'll know it when uh, he says it and you melt <laughs> all over the floor. And I said, OK. So what is life? I guess it's one of those things where it's a gradual transition. There's a lot of gray area. But you know it when you see it, you know. But that's not always very satisfying. And this is, this is something we struggle with, actually, in origin of life studies. You know, we can't even define the thing that we're trying to study in a very clear way. Uh, what about plate tectonics? Is plate tectonics life? As I mentioned, we can say that many things are, uh, have those characteristics that you look up on Wikipedia and you say, OK, look, uh, it's organized into cells. Right? It has uh, autocatalysis. Uh, I didn't mention this before, but uh, something that might be interesting to a lot of people here is that plate boundaries, which are formed when you break the lithosphere into the plates, uh, 
they, they, they stay weak for practically the entire age of the planet. Once you break the lithosphere, the Earth remembers it's broken. How does it do that? We think that it does this by reducing the grain size to very, very small grains, and then uh, mixing grains with different stoichiometric chemistry. So Mg2SiO4 and MgSiO3, for example, all of pyroxene. If you mix those together, then you can have this phenomenon called Zener pinning, which prevents Oswald ripening and the growth of the grains and the healing. Um, so this process is auto-catalyzing. And uh, once you generate the energy to break the lithosphere, which is a lot probably, once you do it, then it becomes easy to do it, just like life developing catalysis and being able to catalyze its uh, processes. Plate tectonics does the same thing. And it probably happens in the early Earth when there's a lot of energy available in the environment to do this kind of stuff. We also believe that planetary mantle convection, uh, which is the convection currents of the mantle in, on the Earth, met, plate tectonics is just the surface expression of that, but then it has an internal thermostat. And here's how it works. Basically, the rate of heat carried by convection increases as the internal temperature increases, right? The viscosity decreases, and the temperature difference that drives convection increases. So basically, the Rayleigh number is increasing here. You expect the heat flow carried by convection to increase. So that's straightforward. And then you have internal heating. This is the heat that's available inside the planet, either original heat, heat generated by radioactivity, or other sources, um, which is going to be carried out. And there's an equilibrium which could occur between these two things called the Tozer equilibrium, named after the, the geophysicist who proposed it. In any case, it's a stable equilibrium. If you were to perturb it this way, say, to higher temperatures, you would uh, increase the heat flow and cool the mantle back down to this point. You could also perturb it this way, and it would cool the mantle, and it would decrease the heat flow, and internal heating would bring the temperature back up. So there is a thermostat which decides what temperature uh, a planet has in the interior. Um, organization, plate tectonics, is well organized. You see these uh, plates. They seem to have a characteristic size. Some of them can be relatively small. Uh, some people have actually tried to look into the question of whether they can be described as fractal, uh, with the answer being no. But there is a certain organization of plates, and they do seem to uh, do the, the, the best that they can do to uh, transfer heat energy from the surface to the interior. Metabolism, so what do they feed on? They feed on the gravitational potential energy, which is built into a hot planet in a cold space environment. Um, this is just a simple convection uh, at a Rayleigh number, similar to what we think the Earth's mantle should have. And uh, that naturally develops into cells, and these become self-organizing. In a plate tectonic system, there's interaction between these convection currents in the deep part and the rheological complexities at the surface. Um, that's not represented in this one. We think that plate tectonics grew. It probably started in one part of the Earth first, and then it took, started to take over other parts. If we go to the early Earth, uh, we can see very different environments represented. Uh, the oldest rock samples in southwest Greenland look like they have uh, structures that are consistent with the subduction zone setting, which is very interesting. Not too different from what you have here on the east coast of uh, Kyushu or Honshu. Um, adaptation, of course, plate tectonics can adapt over time. Um, response to stimuli, there's other things. I could go on and on. I'm not going to delete these points because I want to say some other things. Um, the, the thing is that, what is the point? Uh, plate tectonics is obviously not life, right? But it is an important process that shapes the Earth. And what we try to think of the role of plate tectonics in life is that life is a good surfer, uh, but it needs waves in an ocean to surf, right? You can't be a good surfer in a pond with no waves. It just doesn't work. 
And so plate tectonics has all of these complexities and this energy which is propagating through these processes down to smaller and smaller scale then meets carbon-based chemistry which has this uh, combinatorial explosion in the kind of arrangements and, and chemistries that can emerge. And that's what leads to, to life on a, on a planet. Um, so the LC philosophy is that life is a planetary process. That's our approach. We try not to distinguish between life and the planet which uh, gives rise to life because uh, life emerges from natural processes on that planet. Um, you know, there are some alternate hypotheses, of course. People have proposed that maybe an alien spaceship flew through the solar system four billion years ago and then they put uh, some garbage on the surface and then that became life on the Earth and flourished to become us. But that's not really a, a, a testable hypothesis and it looks like the characteristics of life that we know of seem to have traits which suggest a very strong connection to geochemistry and geological processes. Um, life is unstable. So all of the really essential biochemical components that make life possible are unstable. You put them in water, you put them in, in, a, in a natural environment, they break down very quickly. Um, so life is a process, it has to regenerate its most essential components. And so this regeneration, this cycling, is what uh, allows <coughs> these dynamics to become accelerated and to go into time scales where we can talk in a, in a room for, for seconds and convey something meaningful, whereas a planet <coughs> takes millions of years to do anything worth mentioning. So in the last part, I want to just mention some of the challenges of, of this project. Um, you know. The, the origin of life is a big problem, and uh, what we've been is in a sort of reductionist time, I think, in the 20th century. So what is a, what is a discipline? A discipline is an area of knowledge that's big enough to be put in one person's brain. If it's bigger than one person's brain, then it can't be a discipline, right? That's been the, the, the kind of way, the approach that's been used. But disciplines do grow, knowledge grows, and then they become too big for one brain to hold, and so you got to break them into two pieces, and then you got uh, two disciplines and two brains. Um, but then, of course, those grow, and then you make four, right? And those can fit inside those four brains, and then it just keeps on going and going. And uh, but where do you, what do you do when you have a big question, one that's bigger than? all of these brains, you know, can handle. Um, this is the problem we have with the question of the origin of life. I think it's almost certain that there's not going to be some single person, some genius who comes along and figures all this out. You know, that's just not going to happen. Um, to address this question, we have to tackle this problem with, that we've uh, reduced our science into small domains which are not able to come together. Uh, I like to use these effects sometimes in keynote presentations. But, so we need to get these brains to come together and to rally around the big questions. And I think that's uh, the main task. And this is the, the vision that we've been trying to achieve at LC. So as head of the recruitment, what I did uh, a long time ago was to uh, put everybody on a plot like this. So these were LC members in the early stage of the institute, and each line represented some uh, collaboration between them. And then the color of the line represented the nature of the collaboration, red being more earth and planetary science oriented, and blue being more life science oriented. And so I wanted to make sure that we were building a brain which had synapses firing between the neurons. And uh, we decided that we would recruit people specifically to fill these gaps. Uh, our biggest priority would be to put somebody who would cross, say, this bridge here. We've got only two connections here and here. So 
in the meantime, in the past couple of years, we've hired a whole bunch of people to fill that gap. Um, and in so doing, try to make a sort of uh, communal intelligence, an uh, institutional brain, which can function in a way that allows big questions to be addressed. Um, so that's the, that's the, the, the thing. I mentioned before that the hero hero based science model is something it's it's more or less a fairy tale it's been shown historically to be inaccurate in a lot of cases um, this is Anpanman I, I know about Anpanman because I have small children living in Japan and so I'm not allowed to forget about Anpanman but uh, Anpanman's a hero and uh, uh, what does a hero do uh, so to be a hero you have to have somebody who assumes responsibility and takes charge. Um, they have to be the deepest thinker. They also have to be the broadest thinker because they have to cover all these fields. Uh, they have to be creative and original. They have to be uh, charismatic because they have to, you know, sell, sell themselves to others. They have to be a natural leader. They have to uh, be an inspiring teacher. You know, you just go on and on. There's all these things. You have to be a good writer. You have to be the best technician in your field. You have to be the, an excellent manager because you're going to have a lot of resources you need to direct. You need to be friendly and collegial, but you also have to uh, be a prolific fundraiser, get lots of money. You have to be a tough fighter and defend your turf if it's threatened. Um, and, of course, you can't have any personal life because you can't do any of these things. <laughs> so... This is hero-based science, and it's, and it's kind of absurd. I, I believe that every person is different. We all have different strengths and talents. Some of us are better at making hypotheses. Some of us are better at writing grant proposals than others. Some of us are better at being technicians. Some of us are better at being uh, uh, really detailed and oriented. Some of us are, are good at, you know, there's many different things, many different talents. And to suppose that any single person should have all of these traits is to kind of, I think it's, a, it's, it's to disrespect human nature. And I think we have to be more realistic. Um, in our fields, there's uh, this kind of mystique about Charles Darwin, for example. And of course, he was a really great scientist. He did really great work. But a lot of the credit that he's been given is uh, quite a bit overblown, I should say. Um, he was around at the right place at the right time. And a lot of the ideas that he expressed uh, in The Origin of Species were already ideas that had been floating around. All he did was to articulate these ideas in a way that, that made sense and to bring them together. So he was a, an integrator, but all the pieces were already in place. And to give one man credit for all that is, is an absurdity. So I say no. So, how do we succeed? Uh, communication is really important. If we want to have synapses firing, the neurons have to talk to each other. They have to speak a common language. You know, uh, English is the one we've been given in the sciences. Um, so we always use English in our LC communications. I, it's bad for me. I really wish I could study more Japanese because um, if I weren't at LC, if I were in a different place in Japan, I would, I would be so fluent right now in <laughs> Japanese. But because I've been at LC and, and because of this need, I, I'm actually uh, developing my language skills much slower than I would like. Um, we don't allow secret meetings at LC. No boy, nobody can get, have any meeting room or anything without it being announced to everybody and visible on our display boards. Um, calendars, uh, uh, any events, uh, we have TV screens, email lists, uh, we have communication meetings where all the institute gets together and we announce things. We have communal spaces, which are very important uh, for people to come together. And we have, of course, many uh, integrative events. We have lunch talks, symposia. We have a softball team. We were uh, third place this year in the Tokyo Tech Tournament. We compete against all of the other academic departments. But it's, it's fun, fun things like this. Um, you know, open-mindedness and flexibility are important. We all need to kind of sit back and think, oh, what can, we, what can I do in this other problem that's outside of my usual thinking? 
you know, have that sort of open-mindedness is really important, and to create a culture that promotes that is really important. Of course, we need a lot of money. Um, WPI gives us some money, but it's not enough, actually, to do everything we need to do. Um, one of the problems, actually, is we, I found that uh, Kikenhis are very dangerous to a, an institutional mission like Elsie's, like Eisner's, like others. Because if everybody can just go get their own Kikenhi money, then what is the motive for them to work together? How do you bring people together? To bring people together, to work on things together, you need money to do that. You have to have that. And Kikenhis are not a good way to do that. Um, you need an adaptive organization. So we call, we, we use numbering systems like you do software. We have the 2.0. We're actually working on a 3.0 version right now. So you have to adapt and adjust and change as the institute grows or changes or its needs, needs uh, change. You need to have a vision, of course a roadmap that inspires people to do certain things and that's well understood. For everybody to know their place on the roadmap and how they can contribute to it is really important. Um, diversity, um, I'm not sure. I, I just threw this on here because uh, Petros is here and this is a, a panoramic shot I took of Chicago when I was there last June. But uh, you know, diversity is really important. So you have to have uh, a lot of people who think very differently to break out of the, uh, you know, the, the single-minded uh, way of, of thinking that goes along with most disciplines. We have, to, uh, we have to step outside of our comfort zones a bit. We need good facilities. This is a picture from Elsie's new building um, in, in, a, in the common space. We call it the Agora. But uh, it's actually a very pretty building made by architects on the campus. All of you are invited to come. Please, anybody at Eisner, we would love to have you come visit. If you're in Tokyo, uh, drop us a note and come, come by and visit. We love to, to see people from, from our fellow WPIs. Um, we need to employ modern tools. This is a photograph of a not very modern tool. This is an old fashioned supercomputer. Um, See, so there's this guy who's standing over and he's organizing these uh, secretaries to tabulate numbers and uh, I don't know, somehow this uh, results in a useful calculation. I'm not sure exactly how it worked, but in, in the old days, of course, we don't want to do that anymore. I mentioned uh, getting external funds, uh, Kikeni funds. Kikeni funds are good for, tr for funding traditional, well-established lines of research. But if you want to do something new, you want to change directions, Kikenis are not good for that. Uh, Kikenis are also difficult uh, for if you have international science going on because people from other countries don't know exactly how Kikenis work and how to uh, propose successful Kikenis. Um, Cross-discipline integration, how do you teach people about important work? That's a really uh, difficult thing. Uh, we have some things that we try to do to uh, tackle this problem but it's always one of the, the biggest challenges. Um, spirit of the Institute is important. We, uh, we make sure to include the admin and secretarial and other staff as part of our social events and things like that. We try to make them feel integrated and part of the family because uh, this kind of culture of the Institute feeds back on itself and uh, you know the, the kind of excellent feelings that a, a, a staff will have about uh, their job will feed back into the experience that a visitor will have while coming to LC, and that's really important, and that, this all uh, is important for our success. And growth is always difficult. Uh, what do you do? Um, every time you change, it's like a phase transition. Everything has to change as you grow. So that's about the right time. That's the end of my talk. I. Uh, have some more stuff I can talk about after the talk, about uh, what what I think causes plate tectonics and things like that. But uh, this is a good summary for now, and I'll I'll, I'll leave it with that. <laughs>